Welcome to Advocates the Podcast. On this episode, we speak to Baroness Helena Kennedy QC. She is one of the most distinguished lawyers in the UK and has spent her career championing those who have little or no power within the system. Helena advocated for women in domestic abuse cases before it was popular to do so. She has also represented MI6 agents, persons accused of terrorism, and has appeared before the European Court of Human Rights. Helena was way ahead of her time, and we are very privileged to have her here on Advocates, the podcast. Baroness Kennedy, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. All right. I'll just start by asking the traditional, the way we usually do is, which is asking you a bit of your background. I read that you were born in Glasgow, Scotland, in an area called the Shores. Could you just explain to our listeners all over the world, what is the Shores? Well, when I became a member of the House of Lords, you have to choose an area which is, which is your barony, the place which is supposed to be in the olden days when aristocrats were given that title, they were given lands. We're not given lands anymore. <laughs> so when I became a baron, they ask you to choose a place which you might be connected with to be your barony. And so you don't get to own it. But I was brought up in, in Glasgow, in Scotland, on the south side of Glasgow. And there are little sort of pockets of, of areas which have the word Shaws attached to them. Ah, I see. Your, your parents... It also, uh, I, I, sorry. Sorry, Baroness, please continue. No, I was also going to say that there's a great novel by Robert Louis Stevenson, the Scottish That's novelist. Right. And in it, he describes Balfour going to the House of Shaws to reclaim his title. And so it had a lit literary connotation. And I'm a, a great book reader and a great kind of book girl. And so it was one of the novels that I loved as a, a young person. And so it had that connection too. Your love for books, is it due to the influence of your parents? Because I read your parents were what could be described as labour activists. Uh, could you just tell us, our listeners, a bit about your parents? Well, my parents were unschooled. My, I mean, when I say unschooled, they, they went to school and they went to school until they were 14. They were both very clever people, but they, they were not from well-off families. And so they did go on to education beyond the age of 14. And so they were ordinary working people. And so I didn't come from a privileged background. I came from a very simple background. But my parents were very, they were great humanitarians. They, they did a lot in their community. They didn't just want things to be better for their own children and family, but for the rest of the community too. And so my father, who worked in newspapers, but not as a journalist or in a skilled role, he worked in the end of newspapers where you dispatched the newspapers to the country. But he himself was a great reader. And he firmly believed that the way to make our country a better place was to give greater opportunities to the children of families like ours. And he wanted us to have an education. He wanted ordinary people to have decent housing. And he and my mother uh, saw that the best way of uh, achieving that was by being members of the Labour Party, which they were. And they were great supporters of Labour in the 50s. Right. But when you were young, Baroness Kennedy, when you went to school, you, you went to the famous um, Holyrood. Is that how you pronounce it? Secondary school. And you became hit girl, right? I did. And... And, and you got accepted to read English in Glasgow University. But before you did that, you went down to London. And I suppose the course of your life changed. You, you became a lawyer instead. Could you just tell us about it, how, how that happened? Well, I, I did have a sense, because of reading books about the world, I did have a sense that I wanted to experience the world beyond my own city. And... There was not a lot of encouragement to go anywhere other than to university in our own city. But I came down to London and got a summer job and it was in an office in the city of London. And I was really just a, a runner. I was just a, a helper. And I was what was then called a girl Friday, which was that you were somebody who just did everything and made cups of tea for people and dealt with the post. And so I got to know people and I got to understand the world a bit better, a bigger world. 
And so I decided through meeting them and through meeting some who some some of the and they were basically men who were studying law, I got interested in the idea of doing law. And I was at school a very good debater. I always took part in the in the debates. It's a great tradition in Scotland. And uh, and so I knew that I was rather good at public speaking and about making an argument for a position, you know, for one side of an argument or another. And so I became interested in the idea of studying law through meeting other young people, but who were a bit older than me, who were already studying law. And I thought, I'd like to do that. And so that was what made me divert, change my, my position. And I would like to go to London. I would like to study law. Now, that was a very frightening and unusual thing for a girl to do back in the 70s. And my parents, my mother, were very anxious about the idea of my being in this terrible den of iniquity that was London in her. <laughs> and my father was the father of four daughters, so he was anxious for, 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 for me. But, but I really wanted to do it. And so I came down and I lived in student accommodation and I studied law and, and I loved it. From the very beginning, I, I, really, I really took to it. And so I became very clear that this was what I wanted to do. And I decided, although I had started off imagining that I might be a lawyer who would work perhaps for trade unions and so on, I then decided that I really wanted to be a courtroom, a courtroom advocate. And I... I really wanted to make a difference to people like the people I came from, you know, ordinary people who are quite intimidated and frightened of law. And so that's always informed the choices that I've made. Well, the name of this podcast is The Advocate. So the question, I suppose, the obvious question is, were you always interested in the advocacy part of the law, i.e. being a barrister? Was there any moment when you were studying law at the Council of Legal Education that you were thinking you'd like to be a solicitor or being a barrister was all that you aimed for? Well, of course, back in those days, I mean, you've got to remember, we're going back to the 1970s, really, at the very late 60s, early 70s, when I was a student. And back then, there were different ways of becoming a lawyer. And you could do a law degree or you could do another degree, but then come to the Council of Edu Legal Education to do professional study to become a barrister. Or you could move to the solicitor side and go down that avenue to become a solicitor. And of course, we have the divided profession and still we have the divided profession where there are solicitors who usually are the people who are the first responders to the problems that people have. And then the, the advocate as the person who gives the sort of strategic advice then about how to advocate for the case in court. And so I instinctively felt that it was it was the advocacy side that appealed to me. When I, I went to the Council of Legal Education, I joined Gray's Inn, which was one of the inns of court. And I was a member of Gray's Inn parallel to being to study at the Council of Legal Education. And that was how I qualified, which was possible then. It's different now. And so back then, after you got called to the bar, not too long after being in practice, you set up garden court chambers. Yes, I did. You were just 24 years old at the time. <laughs> Could you just tell our listeners, what was the motivation of setting up chambers at such a young, tender age? And how many years in practice were you when, when you did that? The thing was, I mean, it's about necessity being the mother of invention. <laughs> I, at the time, it was very hard for women. It really was. Lots and lots of sets of chambers said they did not take women. They felt that we were a poor investment that we would go off and have children. It was always assumed that you, we wouldn't be very effective in court because we were going to be too passive, that we wouldn't have this fighting spirit. We wouldn't like the taste of blood. And, you know. and of course, I, I have I'm sorry to interrupt you there, but Baroness Kennedy. Could I just ask, did, did, did these people tell you, in, tell you directly in the face all that? Oh, they, no, they would say we don't take women. They would say we don't Ooh. take women. <laughs> Right. They actually, they actually said that um, we don't take women, and lots of chambers said we don't take women. And so when I was looking for a pupillage, which was one of the, it was that was the apprenticeship part of one's training. Mm -hmm. um, I was right. Looking for a pupil man, and of course, almost everyone at the bar was a man, and I was looking for people, and the men would say, "You can't join our chambers. We, they just don't take women. The clerks won't clerk women. You see, there used to be 
the way that chambers were organized was that everybody was self-employed, but you would gather together in a collegiate way in a set of chambers. And the chambers would be sort of, if you like, administered by a, a set of clerks. And there would be a senior clerk and then under him, junior clerks. But the senior clerk ran things with a rod of iron. And he was an ordinary man. He wasn't a man of great education, but he was a, basically an agent for you. And he would get you work. And they were the people who would, you know, be talking to solicitors and finding out when big cases were going to come in. When the police arrested people, they would know what was, whether a trial was going to take place. And they would try and get the work for the people inside their chambers. So the clerks were agents and had a very important role. They could make or break the success of a, of a, of a barrister. And so... They, of course, were very conservative, with, you know, with a small C. They were always very traditional. And they, they, they had an investment because they got 10% of the earnings of the barrister. <laughs> and if you, you were going to um, bring in women, and then they took time out and had children and so on, it was not it was going to pay the clerks. And the clerks had a big role in deciding who got taken on in chambers. So chambers would say, you know, it's, the men that I was approaching and saying, would you take me as your pupil? They would say, listen, Helena, our chambers don't take women. The clerks wouldn't, wouldn't entertain it and they wouldn't get you work. They wouldn't, they wouldn't bother to try for you. And so it was very despairing. And, and that was true for other people who were different. You know, um, certainly people from ethnic minorities. I mean, there were very few coming to the bar at the time, but people from ethnic minorities faced the same problems. I mean, men from ethnic minorities and people from, from the lower classes uh, faced those problems. Now, although I came from a very ordinary family, because I was from Scotland, it was more difficult to work out what my background was. My big handicap, though, was that I was a woman. And so a group of us got together and there were three, we got three men and three women. We were very egalitarian and we set up a new set of chambers. We decided we, if we're going to have difficulty finding a place in a chamber, a permanent place, then we should set up our own chambers. It was unheard of at the time. Nobody did that. They thought, this is ridiculous. Where are you going to get work? And so we got ourselves a very junior clerk who had not a lot of experience, but he was a very ambitious young man. And, uh, and we, we offered him a job, but on a salary, so that he couldn't say, oh, I'm going to give the work to the men and not to the women. So we made sure that he was on a salary. And we found two rooms which were in Lincoln's Inn. And I have to honestly tell you that we saw them advertised on a notice board in Middle Temple Lane. And I opened the glass window and I stole the notice so nobody else applied to the room. <laughs> so my success started with a crime. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Hence, I suppose you're extremely caring of your clients nowadays, Baroness Kennedy. I'm actually quite interested in, in that part of practice, actually, where you say just now you employ, a, a, you salary your clerk, I suppose, pay them a, a good salary as opposed to uh, following the usual practice. And then later on, when you set up Dowdy Street Chambers, I think the system evolved again when you introduced practice managers, right? And this is the, the part I'd like to ask you because, you know, you got this reputation of defending the downtrodden, you know, the poorest section of society. And yet you were very practical minded in terms of your practice. You, I mean, you had foresight and saw how the practice ought to go. Could, could I just ask where did this other side of Helena Kennedy come from? Is it because you're Scottish? I think so. I think, and, <laughs> and, and you know, in my life, I've realized that I'm actually very entrepreneurial. You know, and I think that came more from my mother than my father. My mother was was a wonderful sort of manager of the household finances, really. She, and she really could stretch her money well and so on. And she was very canny, as we say in Scotland. And so I do think that it was partly that I worked out that it was going to be to our disadvantage as women if the people got a percentage on our incomes and and although at that time I was certainly not planning to have babies or anything, I did think that at some point in my life I might want to have children. And I just thought this is not going to be good for women. If we want to change things for women, that was one of the things that had to change. It was very funny because making that change actually became the prototype much, you know, a decade later 
for other sets of chambers. The much more traditional bar suddenly thought, well, actually, that makes sense. Why, why, why are we paying a percentage of our income um, in this way? We should be salarying people and give them bonuses if they bring in particularly good work for us. So there's ways of re rewarding success amongst the clerks, but not by having this business that they have such control over, over your work and the choices that you make in your work. Can I just ask, um, at that time when you started this new setup for Clarks, uh, I assume you received lots of Christmas cards from Clarks around uh, Lincoln's Inn and, uh, and, and the rest of Chambers. <laughs> well, I can tell you that it was, it was very much frowned upon. It was seen as being a, a very radical departure from a, a grand tradition. And so it wasn't, it wasn't received with warmth by the rest of the bar. And the other thing that we did was that we did a lot of work for what happened in the 70s was that there was the creation of, of law centres. And that was an effort to try to bring to a community level, uh, to bring legal advice to ordinary people who would not, who, who wouldn't go to law firms. And the law firms often were not interested in the kind of work that was involved, you know, things to do with things like that, that have become very important in our societies now, like domestic violence, issues involving youth offending, juvenile offending, um, issues to do with uh, people living in very poor housing, so landlord and tenant disputes over very, very horrible premises that people were having to live in. We, we took on issues on behalf of um, there were, there were also in that period, there was a sort of rise of racism in London. And so we took up those cases that, that a lot of law firms didn't want to do. And so we went earning tons of money, but we were doing stuff at the, the, uh, that was hard and difficult where people needed legal advice and legal assistance. And so it started at that very poor level. That, then I became someone who started doing uh, civil rights cases, which were around issues to do with um, discrimination, discrimination against people on the grounds of their sexuality, discrimin you know, where men being arrested, you know, if they looked, if they, if they went into a lavatory and they seemed to look to the side, there would be a policeman in there from the vice squad who would arrest them. And, and often these men had done nothing, but they would plead guilty to offences because they just didn't want their employers or their parents to know. And so there was a terrible, terrible harassment of gay men in, in that period. There were cases that involved cases of racism, cases of discrimination, people arrested on protests, um, you know, about uh, uh, the conditions of their lives. And so I became a lawyer who did a lot of that. And then by the late 70s, the, you'll remember that the, we had faced the troubles in Northern Ireland. And I was instructed in one of the big terrorist trials in 1976 or 7 as one of the junior lawyers and then I became someone who was regularly doing cases of quite a high level involving national security, allegations of terrorism, difficult cases. But the great thing in Britain at that time was that there was a genuine belief that even, even people who were might be deemed to be enemies of the state should be properly represented by the bar and the rule of law mattered. And so therefore, legal aid should be spent on making sure that they couldn't complain about the process. And so I started doing those cases and I did them all the way through the 80s and into the 90s until, until we had the peace process in Northern Ireland. I also, but as a result, of course, you know this, as you become an expert in a particular area of the law, I became an expert about forensic matters. I became an expert in the particular uh, law involved. And so you keep being asked to do the same kind of case. I also, uh, the same in a parallel uh, uh, development, I was always interested in the rights of women. And I, from the, a very early stage of my career, I was advocating changes in the law for women because the nature of law, you know, the, I've written about this, the nature of law is that in our societies, it was men who were in politics. It was men who had power. It was men who were in the senior judiciary. The rules of our societies were made by men. And so often, and this is not intentional, but often the perspective of those rule makers, whether as judges, as politicians, as well, you know, our, 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 our um, you know, governments, 
they they were they were it was it was men who were in those spaces and they made law and so often it didn't work for women law has often not delivered well for women and justice systems have often not delivered well for women so i started looking at that and then looking at ways in which the law ought to be uh, changed advocating for change and one of the things that i think was important around that period of the late 70s into the 80s was that i felt very strongly that we had to stop mystifying law we had to start talking about law in language which was very accessible uh, so that people could know what their rights were know where law was failing for them and so i started uh, you know i was invited often to do broadcasting you know i'd be invited into studios to be interviewed when cases took place or when there was an issue in parliament and so i became a sort of go-to lawyer who the broadcasters liked because i could talk about law in a way that wasn't off-putting to ordinary people and that gave me an avenue for arguing for changes in the law for women and of course that was about violence towards women the domestic violence about which women don't want to speak because they feel ashamed and so they don't seek help and often inside their own four walls with their partner their husband they are controlled and experience abuse and girls in the streets going to school and coming back from school the ways in which they're harassed and they of course they think that they can't complain and they think that they might be blamed if they do complain and that, that exists in our societies to this day but of course i was looking at, at the a more serious end at rape at the use of serious violence and i was looking at the ways in which law could be changed to deliver justice for women so i've done that nationally and that in turn my engagement with law and my engagement actually with also with other things like constitutional change has meant that i that was what led to my being i became a queen's counsel because i was doing such serious big cases and i became a queen's counsel when when i was just 40 so i was that's comparatively in the scheme of things that's sort of uh, you know youngish and you know when i became a queen's counsel there only had been sort of 30 38 before me in, in the whole history of women going to the bar, which was like a hundred years, well, not quite a hundred years, it would have been more like 60 years at that point. I can't remember. But anyway, <laughs> yes, the first woman that went to the bar was in about 19, in the 1920s. So here we were in the 70s, so it was about 60 years, so it was 70 years. And so I became a Queen's Council or leading council. And then when Tony Blair became the Prime Minister, I, I had done a lot of work on the Human Rights Act and the incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights into English law and into Scots and you know, into the UK law generally. And so I was invited to be a member of the House of Lords uh, to help put that legislation through. So it's been a great honour and privilege to be there because it means that I've both practised law, I've been involved in laws making because I have at least a voice in and strength of law and so on. Baroness Kennedy, could we just pivot a bit now to your career, I suppose, as an advocate, as, as a barrister. Before you became QC in 1991, you obviously was, was a junior member of the bar, but I see here you, you did, <laughs> well, for one of a better phrase, really, really heavy cases even before you became QC. I mean, you were, you were junior counsel in a in a, Myra, in a Myra Hindley case. I think Gopal uh, would like to ask you a question on that case. Yeah, um, actually, there's a couple of questions I'd like to ask, actually, uh, Baroness Kennedy. And the, the first is this. As a young barrister, you, you set up these new chambers. And we all know as advocates, you need to learn from people. Who inspired you in, in those younger days at the bar? Well, I had a wonderful pupil master, uh, Monty Sherborne, and it was the first six months. And my second six months, I, ha I was with Brian Sedgemore, who was a very um, courageous advocate and not fearful at all of any judge. And so I think I did uh, learn a lot from him about making a stand in the court. I also had the great experience at that time of being a junior counsel to some really wonderful advocates, QCs at the bar. Um, one of them was a man called Bruce Lochland, who became a judge at the Old Bailey. And it's that wonderful thing of working with a senior person who, who really wants to develop your skills that is so important. But I, I can't go on without mentioning that in my sort of 
when I was about 26 or 27, I was in court at the Old Bailey and a very famous American lawyer came into the courtroom and I was on my feet doing my stuff and he sent me a note and, you know, he was sort of wanting to know more about the case and so on. And at that time, we didn't have all the, the, the restrictions that COVID or, or that terrorism have made on courtrooms and security. And if a, if a distinguished lawyer was coming from another jurisdiction, they were often just allowed to come and sit in the back of the court, the well of the court. And so I went over and spoke to him at an interval in, at one stage and he asked me about the case. And he was, as I say, a famous American lawyer. And he and his wife and family came to London often and they became great friends of mine. And I then started going out to the United States and I spent time in his law firm. And I went out, I went with him when he was doing cases at the Supreme Court in Washington. And he was a very important influence in my life because he made me think of law on a bigger, on a, on a sort of bigger template. You know, he made me think, of the ways in which the Bill of Rights in the United States could be a very useful mechanism for securing justice for people. And so I, it made me one of the leading voices in Britain for, the, to, for us to actually adopt the, the European Convention on Human Rights into English law as a way of having a, a Bill of Rights in the UK. And I learned a lot from him con about constitutions. And, and could uh, you tell us what, what his name is? That man was Leonard Boudin. It was a man who, during the, the 50s, when the McCarthyism was um, happening in the United States, and lots of people like Paul Robeson, Lillian Hellman, the writer, lots of distinguished people in the arts were being accused of being sympathizers with communism or being communists. And that whole business of freedom of thought and freedom of expression were all being, at that time, were under attack. And he was a lawyer who was fearless and he acted for many of them. He was not a communist himself, um, but he believed very strongly in the, in, the, in the American Bill of Rights. I think that's really interesting that you've taken something from another jurisdiction and applied it in the, in the UK. Could I just now turn to, to Myra and I, and I have to ask you, what was she like? I was the junior counsel in a case where Myra Hindley, who had been convicted of the most grievous crimes, being, being ancillary uh, to the murder of children. She was uh, the partner of Ian Brady, and together uh, they were a, a horrible, uh, murderous duo. And uh, I, I was a little girl when, when I remember my father not wanting me. I read everything. <clears throat> my father didn't want me to, to read the papers over the case because it was so, so shocking. And there was something really, really pathological about this duo becoming involved in some and such terrible crimes, and they're also being of a sexual nature. So she was a hate figure in Britain, and while she was in prison, she um, uh, embarked on a relationship with a prison uh, wardress, a prison guard who was a woman. And then they they were planning, and they had written letters and so on, which showed that they were planning an escape from from Myra to escape from prison. And I was brought in as the junior counsel. And and when I met her, she was like a she was like a school teacher. Um, she wasn't the the photographs you saw in the press were of this sort of very hard faced, dyed blonde woman, white hair, blonde hair, peroxide, you know, blonde. That she looked like a sort of very cruel, Cruella de Vil, you know. And then when I met her, she was like a she was like a gym teacher and like an athletic, an athletics teacher. You know, she was there. She was wearing uh, dark slacks and a sort of shirt, and uh, she had um, uh, short, smart hair, and uh, and she was in fact quite an attractive woman who wanted to talk about books. It was incredible. I, I don't know how it, it came, but I think that. She asked me what I was reading. It was the most extraordinary thing. And I was, I can't remember what I was reading. I was reading um, Mary McCarthy or I was reading, um, uh, it was the seventies. And so I, I, I can't remember who I was reading, but I always was reading novels and, uh, you know, and literature. And uh, she had done a degree in literature and she was, wanted to talk to me about, you know, James Joyce and D.H. Lawrence and, uh, um, you know, uh, Albert Camus. And, and she, she wanted to talk and she wanted to have an intellectual life. It was so interesting. But she didn't want to talk about her crimes. It was, it, it was all a sort of distraction.
or distract from from the from the, the reality. And um, I felt terribly sympathetic with the woman uh, who had become uh, beguiled by her. Um, this uh, who was a former nun, who was uh, was a, a woman who had very limited experience of the world. And I and I think that Maya was a very manipulative uh, person. Um, but they were certainly um, gave the appearances of being very attached to each other. But Myra Hindley became a symbol of, of something which is interesting to me, which is that she became almost more reviled than Brady because she was a woman. And the idea that a woman would transgress not just the criminal, the, you know, the, the rules by which we live and, and, and commit horrible crimes, but the idea that a woman would be involved in this stuff meant that she was also breaking all the rules as to how, as to womanhood, as to what a woman should be like. And so it, it's interesting that, that that sort of thing hovers in the courtroom when women c commit violent crimes or crimes, which is rare, comparatively speaking, but or crimes against children, that when women are involved in that, there's some, there's a particular feeling in the courtroom and it's quite hard to overcome the sense of revulsion uh, that juries have. And of course, we have a jury system in for these high level crimes in, in the UK. Baroness Kennedy, could I just ask you one more question about one of your cases you handled before you became QC? That's the famous Bradford 12 case in 1982. I think by this time you were about 10 years in practice. You represented Syed Hussein, who 11 other, with 11 other Asian young men had admitted to storing 38 petrol bombs. You ran a defense of, of self-defense because they said they had these bombs in order to protect themselves from skinheads, essentially. Now, Running this kind of defense in, in this kind of case must be extremely, uh, it must be really, really difficult. Could, just, could you just tell our listeners why that defense was run and how did you run that defense of self-defense, i.e. I admit having the petrol bombs, but because I was worried for my safety? That was another interesting case. It was a case where it wasn't just a gang of skinheads, that there was, there was a political party, the National Front, existed at that time and it was a, a really well organized political machine which was fascist and they they really despised i mean there were there were there was part of it the british national party stood for parliament and stood for councils and so on but their their sort of mili military wing was the national front and and lots of young white men who were unemployed or who uh, felt aggrieved about the presence in their midst of of, of people of colour, their behaviour was terrible. I mean, they, they really did do vicious and terrible things. And they mounted a campaign of violence against minority communities. And Bradford was a very, very Asian. And when I, when I use the word Asian, I'm meaning um, people from the Indian subcontinent. They were from Bangladesh, Pakistan, parts of India, but mainly Pakistan and Bangladesh. And they had gone to some of our northern cities to work in, in factories and in uh, they made their homes there as, as immigrants at a time when many, many of our public outfits needed needed workers you know our transport system and so on so bradford was a very very heavily populated by people from minorities and the national front made it clear that they were going to come and they were going to have a rally in bradford on a particular date and busloads of people were coming for that rally and the rally was to say that these people shouldn't be here in the united kingdom and they should be sent home shipped back to where they came from and it was always known, it had happened in other cities, that when those cohorts of organized militias came to the cities, they did grievous damage. And unfortunately, at that time, our police forces were not vigilant enough and were not active enough in protecting those minority communities. And there, was, there had been previous attacks in Bradford and um, the police had not taken them seriously and had not attended. And so people were seriously injured. And so when this rally was being organized and they and it was being and people were being encouraged to come from all over the country to join with the National Front in this rally, then then the, the a group of people in said we have to prepare for the possibility that they're going to actually start uh, causing a, a, a riot and 
and actually damaging our own community. And it might have been ill-considered and rather stupid, but it was about police failure. And so a lot of the evidence in the case was to show the ways in which the police failed to protect a particular section of our community. And so it was. it became a trial really about police conduct and police failure. Mm -hmm. And that was why they were acquitted, really. I think that the people felt, you know, no, we don't want people to be making petrol bombs. We don't want that happening in our cities and in, in our towns. However, our police have to step up and protect people from this kind of fascist attack. And so that was what the trial became about. It was about terrible policing. And on this particular case, your cross-examination of uh, Detective Constable Mullaney has gone down in, into uh, folklore. And um, you asked him, he apparently said that he remembered 200 questions that had been posed to your client. And in your cross-examination, you asked him to remember your first question. And of course, he couldn't, and I'm sure that destroyed his evidence. But my question to you is, what if he had remembered your first question? What would you have done? <laughs> Sorry, I, I, you're going to have to remind me about this. You're far better informed than I am. I do, where, did you, where did you get all this from? Oh, you've got to thank Dave for that, uh, Baroness Kennedy. Yeah, no. Well, uh, from what we've read, you you, you um, cross-examined uh, uh, Detective Constable Mullaney. He said that he'd remembered 200 questions that had been posed to your client. And you asked him where he remembered it from, and he said, from memory. And apparently, you are then supposed to have asked him to, re to whether he recalled your first question in your cross-examination, and he couldn't. Uh, and clearly his evidence fell apart on uh, uh, just based, based on that. So my question to you is, what if he'd remembered your first question? What would you have done? I'd have been in trouble, wouldn't I? But I, I <laughs> it's, it's just that we know, we know how unbelievable those things are. You know, when policemen, uh, the, the classic thing that used to happen in, in the United Kingdom, and I don't know whether it happens in, in, uh, in your jurisdiction, but in those days, it used to be that police officers would give an account of what took place and uh, and they would be allowed to refresh their memory from their notebook and so often they would they would read out their notebook and their notebook would the next police you know policeman number one would read out what was in his notebook and policeman number two would come and he, he would be reading out the same thing and he would have copied exactly what the first police officer had written in his book and what, and what, it, what transpired was that they all sat down together and they all made the same note of what happened. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a, a sort of, I'm going to try and remember now what, what took place. It was a collective memory. The problem with that is that, you know, you, you end up, I mean, of course, you know, people recollect things differently and lawyers can make too much out of differences that are not really significant. But, but creating a collective memory irons out some of the things that someone might think, but I don't think it was like that. And so the, the dominant voice controls the narrative. And that's the problem. And so police officers used to come and make cl most ridiculous claims in court. You know, I, I, you know, I, I questioned him, uh, this man. I, I asked him this question, that question, and so on. And, uh, and they're not taking notes at the time. But I then went back to the police station and I remembered absolutely every single word he said. Not I remembered generally what he said, but I remembered exactly what he said. And so the question uh, was, the test was, well, can you remember what I said when I stood up to question you today? <laughs> and uh, it's a classic trick of the defence lawyer, I'm afraid. <laughs> this episode of Advocates, the podcast, is supported by Taylor's Law School, where you master the skills, tactics and ethics that these top advocates will be talking about. Baroness Kennedy, can, can I just move on a bit now to your career as QC? And I just like to ask you specifically one particular case you did, P Pamela Sainsbury. This was Pamela was a, an abused and battered wife, and you defended him, her, because she murdered her husband. She, what I read here, she tied him up with a rope, choked him to death, and then cut off his head and stuffed it in the meter room because she was so afraid the husband would come after him. You got her off. The jury found her guilty of manslaughter instead of murder. When developing this case and preparing it, and you know, of course, obviously you 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 got to know Pamela, your client. How did you decide to develop this particular the, the strategy in this case? In you know, uh, was it a deliberate strategy on your part that's 
try to get her off on manslaughter because you can't can't possibly get an acquittal. How how do you develop this case as it went on? Well, she was a woman who had been seriously seriously uh, subjected to terrible violence by her her husband. She was a very she was a very lovely woman, and she was totally cowed by him and lived in terror of him. Eventually, he came home one night and he was drunk. And he said to her, when I waken up, I am going to belt the living daylights out of you. I mean, she was basically out, out of her uh, of her mind at the time, of with terror about what he would do, because each time the batterings got worse and she thought he was going to kill her. And she got the clothesline and she put it around his neck and she tied it to the, 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 the corner of the bed, to the sort of bedstead, and she just pulled it with all her might. And it garroted him. I mean, he ended up sitting up in the bed as she was pulling this thing, and and she strangled him. But she, she, she was at the other corner of the room when she did it, pulling this rope, because she she was too frightened to go anywhere near him. And so it did strangle him. And then she was in terror of what what she was going to do. He was dead, and she then tried to dispose of the body. And and she actually did. She cut up his body using their um, a, an implement that was he used for things in the in the garden or for his work and she put it all into refuse bags into pieces because she couldn't carry him he was a huge big guy and when it came to his head she she was actually disturbed in this process and so she did get the pieces to to a field where she abandoned bits of his, all his body but she his head was there and she put it into this meter cupboard because she told us, she told the psychiatrist, I didn't believe it happened. I didn't believe that I had done this. And I, I had to keep reminding myself that I had done this and it wasn't a dream. And so we really were talking about someone whose mental state at the time was really highly, highly disturbed. And so the reason that she was, that she got the manslaughter, which was on the grounds of diminished responsibility, was that she was suffering from an abnormality of mind at the time. And so the judge, uh, she didn't go to prison. The judge passed a sentence, which meant that she had to have s serious psychiatric help. Although she did, once once the terror of living with this man had been lifted from her, she started making a mental recovery. But the, but the thing that I did in that case, which became one of the things that became very important, was that I got my solicitors to um, employ um, a private detective to to trace the women who had been the previous partners of this man. And what we discovered was that he was a serial abuser. It was important to show a pattern of conduct that with every single woman he'd ever been with, he battered them. He battered and violated them and was and, and terrorized them. And, and they were always just so glad and lucky when he moved on to another woman and so relieved. And you've got to remember this, this was a case that I did in the 80s. And it was when I was building up this practice of, was it, it was in, it was in the 80s, wasn't it? What was the date of that? Uh, early 90s, after you became QC. Yeah, but I had been, I had started looking at the business of domestic violence and the ways in which there's a sort of learned helplessness that women who are subjected to this kind of abuse, people don't understand it and say, why don't they leave this, a man like that? They become so controlled that they lose their own agency. They lose their own mental agency. And they, they, and they become so fearful of the, the control that is exercised. They're often not allowed to see their friends. They're not allowed to visit their own family. They're kept uh, away from people whom they might confide in about his behavior. And so they, they, they start closing in. Their world starts becoming smaller. And, and it all is concentrated around trying to please this person, trying to prevent this person from, from beating them. And so it becomes, it becomes a serious uh, um, mental problem. And, and, and they recover well from it afterwards. But at the time, uh, and they can function, you know, sometimes they can do jobs and so on. But in the dynamic of that relationship, they are utterly controlled. Could I just now pivot a bit from the specific cases and just ask you a bit on advocacy, really? My first question is, with respect to case preparation, yeah? Um, how do you prepare for a case? Do you develop a chronology or do you try to understand the psychology of your client first? How do you do this? When I'm preparing a case, I, 
I always start absolutely absorbing the prosecution case. The case, the statements and everything, the brief that comes to me. You've got to remember that we have this, uh, our, 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 a solicitor will have been involved in the first stages and will be in the in link you know, linking up to the crown prosecution service who are preparing the documentation and gathering the witnesses that will be uh, presented in court so i immerse myself in the prosecution's case first and foremost so that i know what the case against my client is and it's a very interesting thing that quite often i will read the papers in a case and i'll think this guy hasn't got a hope in hell. This is this is hopeless. <laughs> the and then I meet the client, and the client will look at the eye and will say, "I didn't do that, and it wasn't like that." And suddenly, you see a different perspective, and it's 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 a, such an interesting thing that you know it's that business of you know the camera is on one part, one view of something, and then you switch around and you see a much different perspective and so that can often happen but the other thing can happen in the other way where you think oh this is a really this is going to be straightforward this is this is this guy's <laughs> and then you go and meet the client and you think is as guilty as hell and uh, <laughs> so it's, it, it, it is interesting but of course my role is not to decide whether somebody's guilty or not I would never ever I mean the ethics of our, our, of our profession is you don't represent somebody if they say to you, I did do this, but I'm going to say that I didn't. I have to say to them that I'm sorry yourself, somebody else, because having told me that you did you did this, I'm, I'm not going to go into a court of, of law and, uh, and suggest that you didn't. But if somebody, uh, I, I might in my heart think, uh, you know, but I, I'm a professional, I defend people, I do their cases for them. And I, and I, but obviously, you know, I really, I really want to do that, to do the case for them based on the law. Another question I, I like to ask about the, you know, your, your style of advocacy, um, in terms of say cross-examination, uh, how do you do this? Because some of the advocates I've, we've interviewed actually prepare questions in advance. Some don't, some just have areas and what's your approach yourself, Baroness Kennedy? Oh, I map out what I want to achieve in a cross-examination. Where are the areas I want to go into? One of the important things, and I, I always say this to, to young lawyers, is that you have to listen. If you've mapped out questions, I don't do questions. I do what, you know, I, I map out the areas I'm going to deal with. I might occasionally write out a particular question where the wording might be very important. But by and large, I don't write out every question. I don't do that. Because, and I watch people you know, interviewing people on television and they've got their, their, and it means that they're not listening properly to the answer. You've got to be, when you listen to the answer, you might not want to be asking the next question that's on your list. You might want to actually start unpicking what the person's just said. Really? And you might be surprised by the answer. So um, um, I always advise people, don't be rigidly sticking to a list of questions. You have to listen to the answers, and that sometimes may take you off on a different trajectory. Um, you may learn things by really listening carefully to the answer to the question that you've asked. So what I do is I, I, I certainly plan a cross-examination, but I plan it by blocking out the areas of evidence that I want to deal with. In it, I might have a particular question that I will write out because the wording of it will be very particular. And my, I want to be sure that it's not asked in a lazy, in lazy language. But I am not someone who believes in writing out every question, no. Expert evidence. Obviously, in your line of work, you rely and work a lot with, with experts. And sometimes expert evidence and exp the reports prepared by experts can be rather technical. How do you get about explaining it to the jury in not simplistic, but rather simple terms which the layman can understand and can sympathize with, more importantly. Well, listen, it's one of the things I have loved about my professional life is that I have, is the learning that takes place um, by working alongside great experts. So, for example, I've done cases where the forensic experts are experts in explosives or in chromatology or in uh, hematology, blood, and the differences in blood. I've done it where we've examined and dismantled DNA evidence 
So I, I love working with really good experts who then spend time with me so that I really understand. Uh, and for a short period of time, I, I become an expert in their area of expertise so that I can cross so that I can cross-examine the expert um, who will be called by the other side. And then I have to make sure, I mean, what I'm doing all the time is saying, explain that to me. And then I'm trying to translate that into language that is going to be penetrable, you know, that, that, that a jury uh, of ordinary people will understand and will, will be able to fathom. And because I've had to fathom it. And so that is one of the skills of the advocate, in our, particularly given that so much of, of our work now involves high level technical stuff or medical. And it often, when for, as, a, as a criminal lawyer doing serious homicide cases and things, you, you really have to get on top of a lot of medical stuff. But then there's other, there are other areas. I mean, I, uh, I've done cases involving national security did a big espionage case with, involving a man called Michael Bettany, which who had been a had been an intelligence officer in our intelligence services, and who tried to offer his services as a double agent to uh, as an agent to uh, to the Russians. And when I did that case, I mean, the really it was the material was highly secret, very high value confidential material. I wasn't allowed to keep it in, in, in chambers or in my home. Um, we had to go to a particular place for the most secret of the material, a place where such material uh, was being kept. And as the lawyers, we were allowed to go there. We were allowed to see the stuff. We were allowed to sort of do the work, sit and sort of, if you like, study the, the material there and then come away and, and prepare the case back in our office. And even our own notes, we were supplied with a, a special safe in chambers in order to keep our own notes away from uh, any prying eyes. And so, you know, there are ways in which you have to conduct those sorts of cases, which require special vigilance and special consideration. I mean, I've had a very interesting professional life in the work that I've done. And then recently, you know, I went, because of that expertise, I went with the rapporteur for extrajudicial killing, Agnes Kalamar, to Turkey. She is a UN rapporteur, United Nations rapporteur. And Khashoggi, Jamal Khashoggi, the journalist, the political commentator, had been murdered in the Saudi Arabian consulate in Turkey, in Istanbul. And she needed someone who was expert in, in, in these sorts of criminal cases. And so I went with her um, and we had a forensic pathologist and a, a retired senior police officer with us. And we went to Turkey and we were allowed to listen. We, the, the security services, the intelligence uh, services in Turkey, let us listen to the tape recording of the killing of Khashoggi because the place, the consulate had been bugged. And so they had a recording of what happened to him. And so- That must have been very grisly. It was, it was, a, it was a very, very uh, grueling to listen. and 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 so shocking to listen to what happened to that man. Terrible. Could I ask you now, uh, Baroness Kennedy, about appellate advocacy? Now, that's a, that's a completely different skill there, isn't it? Facing judges at the House of Lords, at the Court of Appeal, and trying to convince them that there was some error on the part of the lower court. What's your general approach? Do you pick up three strongest points and just go with it? Or do you try to build up the case slowly during, during your submissions? What I learned, what I've learned is, is, that, is that it is much better to take, to go, to choose some really strong points and to go with them and to not spoil your argument with, you know, less valuable arguments. <laughs> yeah, that's can, right. It's that whole position that any of us as lawyers know where you sort of feel that the, there's a sort of rolling of the eyes <laughs> of those yes, on the bench. Right. It's, it's much better to just hone in on the thing that you think is your strong argument and to go with that and not dilute it by, um, by, by follow-up arguments that are going to weaken the position and also discredit in some ways your better points. It's very tempting to want to cover everything and, uh, and I think that um, sometimes you can devalue your better argument.
by doing so. But that comes with experience, you know. When you're young, you want to you want to put everything in there, and it, it is interesting. Uh, I when you go to, uh, for example, to international courts. I did a case in, at the European Court of Justice where the timing was so limited. A light comes on. It's like the Supreme Court in the United States. You know, a light comes on. You know, warning you that you you know your time's up and you've got one more minute, and so you 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 have to confine yourself to that a very limited time slot. You're sitting down, and your opponent is on their feet in the Supreme Court or in the Court of Appeal or in in the、uh, in the ICJ. What do you take down as a note of what they say? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you take everything down, or do you take do you take specific? I'd like to know sort of what what do you focus on? What do you actually write down? I leave out the the sort of the the the, the ornamentation, if you like. The、um, all all advocates have a level of of ornamentation, you know, where they、um, the the flowery stuff that they, is added to the core. But I'm a great note taker. I mean, even if I'm listening to someone giving a lecture, I like to be able to have a pen and paper with, so that I can make a note of the things that I think are salient and which might be of use to me afterwards. And sometimes the actual words that are used by the advocate on the other side, the actual words that are chosen by the advocate, display something very important about how they're going to be conducting the case. And so,、um, no, I'm a I'm I'm a note taker. Obviously, I have people behind me、um, who are really taking the note, but、um, but I like to take my own note too, and I and I mark it where there's something that I think ah I might I might have to take him up on that, or、um, if a witness is saying something, I I take a note and I I I do a few crosses on the side where I think this is something where I'm going to pull him up. In terms of reading the court, right, and in and I think that's very important, particularly on on. Uh, on matters before、uh, the Court of Appeal or the House of Lords. So, what's your general approach here, Baroness Kennedy? How could you just tell our listeners what the I suppose the tricks of trade that that you have developed over the years that you can see? Okay, right, he, this particular judge is not buying that particular argument. And then, how do you then pivot to the to the next one? I think that there there are advocates who are, who are good at this and others who are not. We all know, and、um, we all exchange views, and we、um, and we tell each other about judges. You know, that's what advocates do. And so, so you get to know your judiciary, and if you're and if you're going to the court of appeal, by and large, you you have you have an idea about the predisposition of certain judges, and that will, in in many ways, affect how you might make an argument. You know that there are people who are much more discursive. That they they want to be able to to you know debate with you, they like that exchange, and there are others who just sit and listen. You know they they present a very immobile face, and you don't know whether you're making gains or 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 not. So there there are some judges that are just very hard to read, but there are others who actually, and I rather like when there's an exchange,、um, when they say, "Lady Kennedy, you know, why would?" You know, why would this section apply in that way? Isn't it saying the opposite of what you're suggesting?、Uh, and I'd rather then it gives me the oppor- opportunity to sort of、uh, to make my, to, to, you know, to, to strengthen my argument. But the the most difficult、uh, court is the court where judges don't give you any sense of the thinking at all. And so yes, you know, we get to know. What、uh, what judges are like? We get to know those who are impatient and want you to get to the argument, get to the get to the gravamen, the the core, quickly. And we know that there are others who enjoy the the discourse. So I I will I will play it according to how I read the court. And it is important to be able to read the court. When you start feeling that the the the, the court is becoming slightly kind of tetchy or、uh, impatient, it's better. It's always better to 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 to. Speak To get on with it,、uh, and not to labour a point, and some people are not good at that. Coming now to the area of the podcast, which we call the rapid fire questions,、uh, which I'm just going to throw you some questions and and、uh, just get a, a, a most immediate response.、Um, first question, Baroness Kennedy, what what do you enjoy most in practice, the intellectual exercise or the interpersonal skills? Oh, I think I'm probably I I like the interpersonal thing. I like. 
I like the business of I, I I like the business of you know trying to hold the jury in the palm of my hand. I'm, I also like the business of trying to really understand what brought this person who's on trial into the dock. What what it, what is their motivation? What is their mindset? I've always been very interested in and and I've worked very closely with psychiatrists that interface of law and psychiatry. So I would say that it's the, it's, the, it's that bit that appeals to me most, but I do enjoy the intellectual uh, challenge as well, and I and I enjoy the performance too. Right, the the opponent you respected you respected most. I mean, one of the things I want to say is that I came to the bar when there were very few senior women, and so I was I was really mentored by men who really were open hearted and generous. Um, and, want, um, and wanted to encourage me to do well. And so I don't want to, you to think that, um, you know, that all men were un, you know, unwelcoming to women. They weren't. <laughs> I, some of my best experiences were by being encouraged by really um, good men. And, and also men who often were on the other side from me. Well, there's a, a wonderful barrister who was a prosecutor that I often was prosecuting, you know, did cases where he was a prosecutor, uh, John Nutting. And, and we're still good friends and uh, a wonderful, wonderful lawyer and advocate. A colleague, Bruce Holder, who became, uh, who's a, became a judge, but who was also the, ended up being the head of the military prosecu prosecutorial service, you know, for in, it was inside the military of the United Kingdom. A wonderful colleague and friend. So, I mean, I, I've had lots of great uh, male friends and amongst the women, you know, there were women. Um, who were, were important. And Brenda Hale, who became our ju judge on the Supreme Court, is a wonderful woman and a supportive woman to, uh, women, woman to other women. But she wasn't a criminal lawyer, but I, I always admired her and I admired her writing and uh, admired the, her forthrightness. Bernice Kennedy, who was the judge who challenged you the most? And most, of, most of them, of course, are dead. And so one, one always doesn't want to speak ill of the dead. Um, there, there were some terribly tough old judges when I was a young woman uh, um, coming to the bar. I do remember, I'm Scottish, and so of course some of my, my language is very clearly um, affected my, by, by my accent. And so I, when I say murder, it sounds very Scottish. And a, a judge once said to me, uh, Miss Kennedy, when you say murder, it sounds as though there was more than one dead body. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but I had lots of I had, I had, lo I had lots of battles. I had particular battles with a judge called um, King Hamilton, who sat um, at the Old Bailey, and uh, he and I had a number of run-ins. Um, but you know, those are the things that um, um, make you a better lawyer and put steel in your in your spine. <laughs> <laughs> and make you, you know, resilient and make you battle on. If there was a case you could go back and re-argue, uh, which case would that be? Oh, a case I would come back. You know, sometimes the, 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 the cases that cause you most pain are not the biggest cases. Um, and of course, you, we like to remember the, 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 the victories and the ones that you won. But the, there were cases where you did feel that someone was punished inordinately, or where you felt that, um, yeah, where where you where you would like to to do it now, knowing the things that you know now. You know, I think of some of the early cases where that were around things like domestic violence and so on. I now have become so knowledgeable in in, in this field that I feel that one could have fought some of the cases differently. But I'm not someone who's given to, to regrets or to going over the past. I think that you really, you learn from your mistakes and you say, I want to do it better the next time. But you know, I did sad cases, women were cases where you know, women were convicted of perhaps killing their babies. And you knew that it was because of their despair, because of the situations in their lives. And they ended up, being punished and you knew that it was really about something much deeper and much more complicated than the court was given to understand and now there's a greater willingness to look at the psychological circumstances that lead people to commit crime what do you like best about practice 
Well, I love the camaraderie of, of being in a profession with, with other lawyers and sharing that, those experiences. I am, um, I'm in a set of chambers with fantastic lawyers and, and, uh, and my women colleagues, you know, the, the, the young women who are coming into the law are truly terrific. They're fabulous. I mean, the men are good as well. But I just want to, <laughs> to speak up to the fact that, the, you know, it's just so heartening for me as a, as a, as a woman who was a lawyer, uh, became a lawyer at a time when there were so few. And they're wonderful women. And the women in my chambers are fantastic women. And they do the most amazing work. And they've got far better brains than I have, I can tell you. But they're just amazing. And, and that's true across the profession. You know, we're seeing lots of great women coming into the law and that will change the judiciary and it will change a lot of things. What, what um, uh, do I take pleasure in? Of course, we want to win. I like winning. I like the victory. Right. I like the situation. <laughs> yes, of course. You know, um, if we didn't win, you know, um, you wouldn't do it. So, you, so I, I, of course, I, I'm, I'm hungry to, to, to win cases, but I want to win them for, I hope, for good reason. But there's always an element of ego in it. We all know that. I've loved my professional life, and I liked, to, I liked the fact that I felt that I was contributing to something bigger than me, and, and I still feel that. I now am the director of the International Bar Association's Institute of Human Rights, and again, work with wonderful lawyers, uh, senior and novices who are coming in. And, you know, the law has to change because the world is changing and the new challenges are about technology, about, um, uh, you know, the, way, the ways in which um, uh, that is affecting uh, legal practice. I'm very interested in, in the challenges that are going to come through, of course, the business of climate change and, and all of that because it creates human rights challenges around the world because many people are going to suffer. I think that the gap between rich and poor has become greater in our world. And so um, that provide, presents real challenges. And we're also seeing a rise of authoritarianism in certain places, uh, um, which, which with governments who are not very respectful of the rule of law. And so on the international plane, we've got our work cut out. So um, I, uh, and I like the challenge of it, but I love the law. What is the most important quality for you in an advocate? I think a really good advocate has to create empathy with those who are listening to them. I think, I mean, advocacy is about communication. And so you have to, of course, have a mastery of law. You have to, you have, to um, have done your homework. You have to have prepared well and all those other things. But for the advocacy, it's really about, uh, I think, creating sense a uh, sort of empathy with the people you're speaking to but about the subject that you're speaking of i think that's the most important thing could you just tell our listeners a typical day in the life of baroness kennedy let's assume you have a big case coming up say you were doing that the transatlantic uh transatlantic bomb plot case in 2006 where right? you're representing arafat khan what was your day like then how, how do you start your day off well, I mean, I, I'm a big one for ex exercising. I try to, I try to keep myself in in fairly good fitness, um, and so I I often would. Um, I mean, perhaps three times a week, I would I would get up early enough to be able to exercise with a personal trainer. Uh, nowadays, I go to Pilates classes and things. But then I used to have a personal trainer when I was doing those sort of big cases uh, in my 40s and 50s. So keeping fit is really important um, for somebody whose work involves often, you know, being being at a computer or at a desk, reading books, reading papers, and so on. You've got to get up and move. But the other thing is that I was a mother of three children and, uh, and married a husband who is a, a surgeon um, with a very heavy uh, and very committed practice in surgery. So um, my family life, you know, is demanding too. And my children's, uh, uh, you know, lives, you know, have to be also looked after um, as they were growing up. Um, all of those things, I think, are have to be kept in a balance. And it's it's useful to uh, if you have a good family life, which is, you know, provides stability and love and support. I've been very lucky. My husband is a wonderful man, and he, and he's been a great, uh, a great husband and father. And, and my children, um, give, you know, provide me with great love and support too. So I, I just, but, but that, that doesn't count. I mean, you have to put in in order to get back. And so 
uh, for for those of us who are parents, then there there are special challenges in all of this, and uh, and so I, I would say that if the difficulties that that women have who have children and so on have to be taken into account in all of this, and there has to have to be ways in which we kind of look at working practices to make sure that they accommodate families, and that's men and women both nowadays because young men now they, they too want to be involved with their children and want to have time and to share and women and women increasingly have careers so we have to be much better about accommodating family life um, for those who practice in the law uh, and I feel that very strongly um, I you know I, I, I made it work but um, but you know for some people it's 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 harder when when you had these big cases these long long trials did you work long hours then I mean, one, one of the things that, you, you know, you had to do and, you know, any woman uh, will tell you this is that, you know, even even those of us with great husbands and good husbands, you know, are, are, that is that, you know, you feel the primary responsibility. And so, you know, I would uh, come home, you know, throw throw, throw the, 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 the briefcase into the corner and and be try to be there for my kids and uh, and helping them with homework or and having supper with the family. And then when they all got to bed, I'm afraid I would burn the midnight oil. I'm a nighttime person now. I really am somebody who, who you know, I find it hard going to bed early because I got into a, got into a practice where, you know, I stayed up um, working on papers into in into the small hours, and that's what you have to do when you're doing a big case. You 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 know you, your sleep becomes deprived. Baroness Kennedy, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you for listening to Advocates, the podcast. If you like this episode, be sure to follow us on all our social media channels. Leave a review or share this episode and tag us. We'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you. Listen to the voices of the advocates.